What is up, everybody? I'm Scott Melker, and this is the Wolf of All Streets podcast. Traditional finance is fragmented. Trillions of dollars are caught up in complicated systems that fail to easily act, interact with one another. Blockchain and crypto help solve this, and that's exactly why I asked today's guest to make a second appearance on the show. John is the president of Ava Labs, whose objective is to open up financial services and products to everyone. John understands legacy finance because on top of Ava Labs, he has an impressive resume in the hedge fund world managing billions of dollars. John Mood, thank you so much for coming back on a second time. Scott, it's a pleasure and it's always fun. It's a great conversation. Awesome, man. I'm glad to have you back. And once again, before we get into the questions, you're listening to the Wolf of All Streets podcast, where twice a week I talk to your favorite personalities from the worlds of Bitcoin, finance, art, music, sports, politics, anyone with a good story to tell. This podcast is powered by Blockworks, the fastest growing media company in the digital asset space. You can check them out at blockworks.co. And if you like the podcast and follow me on Twitter, you can find my newsletter and basically everything else at the Wolf of All Streets.io. So now to dive right into today's episode. I saw you recently had the opportunity to meet uh, Mayor Suarez down in Miami. What, what was that like? Because it seems like they've come out of nowhere as the, uh, as the leader in the United States for uh, crypto and fintech. Well, I mean, you know, we've been growing leaps and bounds. Um, I think last we spoke, we were about like 40 people. Now we're, you know, pressing 100. And we are a very distributed um, global firm. And frankly, there's a lot of people now we're recruiting in the city of Miami. So we need to have a presence there. And Miami's done an unbelievable job of inviting people to come in and build and develop. They're, you know, they want the capital there. They want the intellectual capital there. And they make it very friendly and easy. So it was a pleasure meeting him. And I can tell you, when I walked around the streets in Miami, Brickell, the you know, business area, South Beach area, it literally reminded me when I first got into finance in the late 90s and 2000s on, in New York City, in Manhattan. Everyone is buzzing. Dinners are happening all over the place. Obviously, we have COVID, but even ex-COVID, it just seems a little less energy in the New York area. But Miami, it's picked up all the slack. And I, and I can say the same thing about San Fran, too, by the way. It's like San Fran and New York has kind of lost some energy, it feels like. But the energy is vibrant down there. Yeah, that's what I've heard. It's interesting. I lived there for almost five years until about four years ago. And our joke used to be that the problem with Miami was that nobody had a job or could tell you what they did and nobody cared about anything because everybody was either a tourist or just living off someone else's money in Miami. It feels like there's been this epic transformation now to where it's a legit become a legitimate, legitimate business center. So I'm looking forward to getting back down there and <laughs> spending some time. I think actually the biggest problem in Miami is the weather is so nice. When people go down there, why would they work? They just want to hang out and check out that beautiful view and the sunny and absorb that sun. That was my biggest problem. I had a mu music studio in Wynwood and it would be like, uh, make music today or surf. And surfing uh, like inevitably won every single time. <laughs> I can't blame anyone. Um, so back when we spoke last time, I, I believe your mainnet had literally just launched. I think it was in October. So can you talk about the progress that's been made? You obviously already have told us you went from 40 to 100 employees, which is astounding. So, you know, what's been happening with the main net and the progress? Oh, I mean, first of all, it's a fantastic time for the entire space, I would say yes. a lot of progress for everyone. For us, we have now like 900 plus validators. So we're very decentralized. Um, that's close to like $9 billion of stake value. We have 50 plus live projects that is deploying so, you know, as a refresher, Ava Labs is the team behind Avalanche, which is the protocol. And the protocol now has 50 projects building on top of it. And I can see a clear line to another hundred that is in the process of integrating for the next month or so. And then after that, there's another long line. Um, what else? There's been over 1 million smart contract uh, transactions on the protocol. Wow. The... Um, you know, $120 million worth of assets have come over from Ethereum. There is an Ethereum uh, Ava Labs bridge. It's called AEB. So assets can go back and forth. So it's a lot of momentum, a lot of great things happening. Um, and it's just a lot of fun, basically. Yeah, that's incredible. So I'm actually curious what you just talked about, because we still hear that the bulk of projects are being built on Ethereum, but it sounds like there is this actual sort of migration away. So 
First of all, it depends on which layer one. There's a whole bunch of layer ones and even layer twos out there. I think if I take a holistic view first, you know, I think of the first generation, obviously it was just simple Bitcoin. And that introduced to the world digital money and store value. Then you had Ethereum and Ethereum was fantastic. That, you know, people started building things on top, ecosystems started developing, but there was one issue. You can't have a real economy, a digital economy when costs are high, there's a lot of latency and you can't scale. So transactions can't happen. So this whole new generation, what I call like, you know, crypto wave three, guys like Avalanche and some others have now been building the capability to have faster, larger transactions as well as um, lower costs. So when transactions and exchanges can happen, uh, an economy can happen. So wave three is more like about an economy. And in terms of how we view Ethereum, we think of ourselves, Ava Labs at least, and then Ava Lanch, the protocol, as a not a competitor, a complement to the Ethereum ecosystem. And you know, when um, the team at Ava Labs developed our consensus protocol, it was th with that mindset out there. So now Ava Lanch, a protocol that's out there. I think people who build on top of Avalanche have the same view. In other words, okay, there's a bridge. So people want to go back from Ethereum to us, they can do that. But because of different functionality, they can do different things and create different projects and things that perhaps they can't do over there. But over there, there are you know 2,500 plus devs and large uh, user base. So there are things we can't do that they're doing. And this goes with the other, you know, layer one guys, smart contract platforms as well. So I don't think of us as taking share. I think of they have about Ethereum 2,500. The Avalanche protocol has about 300 developers. I think some of the other protocols have about the same. So that's coming from zero, sure, but 300, 400 is a nice amount. But still, that is still so low compared to the millions that are developing on iOS or Android. Right, so, so Ethereum seems like this monster, but actually relative to any other space, it's quite small. Yeah, that's uh, right. That's, but, that's interesting, you don't really think about that, yeah. But that's, you know, it's interesting because, you know, I try to make analogs from my previous life as an investor. I really think though, uh, wave three is not gonna be a winner take all in this thing. It's gonna be more like winner take most you'll have your equivalent of a Facebook, and then you're gonna have TikTok, Snapchat, Clubhouse, and everyone's gonna have specialties that you just can't replicate being a massive generalist. That, that makes sense, because to me, from, from the outside, obviously, uh, I'm not a programmer or developer, and I'm, I'm not uh, you know, intimately involved, but it feels like we've got this sort of Roman Colosseum gladiator, like everybody trying to kill everybody vibe on the outside. It's nice to hear that you view yourself complimentary, but I'm assuming that it's still extremely competitive, you know, considering how nascent the market is and how fast it's growing. Oh yeah, it's very competitive, but I think competition in general is good. It makes everyone work faster, harder. Um, I don't know what the overlap in those de developer numbers. I can just tell you that the people who want to go on Avalanche, they usually go on for two reasons. One, wow, costs are lower. And two, it's, well, given this ability in the platform, maybe I can do this that couldn't be done somewhere else. Right. So they have the flexibility to maybe build exactly what they want that they can't build elsewhere, which right. leads me to the, the idea. You said that you've already had 50, which is incredible. What kind of projects are you seeing launching on Avalanche? Who, who is you know driven to use you guys as opposed to these other ones? And why is that? Sure. So there are, I would say there are two types of, um, of projects that have been building on top of the Avalanche protocol. One type is um, basically you, end users, for instance, AMMs, people can use. The other type of projects I'll put in the bucket of tooling and infrastructure. So providing some functionality, taking advantage of a different type of technology, different platform that they can build something that perhaps they can't do elsewhere and anticipating for a multi blockchain world, so to speak. I mean, I think we were talking about covalent. That's a perfect example. 
when you have, and they're multi-blockchain oriented. Right. So awesome. the way I think about them, it's very simple. They, 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 are, they have figured a way out to now and create partnerships to basically provide data. And when the data that they can provide in an easy interface, like kind of like an API you can plug in, allows developers to, to actually unleash emergent dreams and technologies because now they have more tools and infrastructure to work with. So it's really two types. Some of them are user interfacing and others are really the backbone that's gonna lay the foundation for unbelievable amount of new projects and things that we can't even imagine right now. I was gonna say, it makes you wonder what it'll look like in 10 years, you know, with the velocity of um, how, how fast things are being built and improvements in technology. It just blows your mind what this could be. I, I kind of hope in 10 years, the answer is the way we treat AWS. It's just there. Yeah. And the benefit of, of this is not only is it just there, I hope we, we adjust for some of the issues I see with what I call web 2.0. In other words, empowering the individual again, giving them their own data, giving them more self-governance because it's distributed or decentralized governance, allowing them to have a vote in everything they do. I mean, um, as an early investor in a lot of these um, Web 2.0, call it uh, tech companies, it was fantastic in the sense that they provided a lot of um, great use cases for individuals. And then somewhere along the line, they took that data and started using it to quote unquote optimize my experience. And then yeah. that's okay. So I can buy something faster because they can show me something better. They can show me news feeds better. But I think somewhere along the line here, we kind of crossed that Rubicon. And now it's like, I own your data. I'm going to monetize your data and I'm going to use it to kind of manipulate you so that you will buy more stuff or, or do something more so I can make more money off of you. And that is, you know, part of the reason why I think there is this great growth in blockchain and crypto, because people look at this as a way to be empowered, as having a vote. I think to some degree, people became the, you know, started as the consumer and became the product, you know, and I don't know when that line was crossed, sort of, as you talked about it, but that to me is the simplest term to view it as, but that definitely lends the question you're building these systems that can stop that, but they're not going to want you to, right? And I've had these conversations where people say, yeah, they'll adapt because they'll have to. I don't buy that, right? I think they'll fight it tooth and nail to the very end because this is how they're making their money. Well, they will. They will fight it. from. But in the end, again, 10, 15 years from now, first of all, there will always be parallel universes. That's usually how these things happen. And a smaller crop and then a larger crop and then they, and the better one ultimately you know, moves into the pole position, so to speak. But what they did in internet and software land was they provided a better experience for the end user because they were able to do it cheaper and for other reasons, because they became from hardware to software and then the network effects took over. And then all of a sudden it was like, you see their margins in, in their companies, like going crazy 67, 80% sometimes, you know, gross margins. And sometimes even EBITDA margins are that high. So basically they made a very lightweight solution. But what the blockchain and cryptocurrency world does is they disintermediate even more and they are still hopefully at some point able to provide the same type of product with even fewer intermediaries and an even more streamlined workflow. So in theory, if you can figure out an income statement on these companies, their margins will be even higher. Right. So ultimately there's an economic reason if this is done well. Also, there is a... I guess, you know, a spirit among people, I, I believe that they love to have more control and more freedom. And if they can be a voice and a vote in how they are monetized or how things work, that probably will overpower any monopolistic uh, body that is just trying to extract their Schumpeterian rents, I, I think. It's almost like going back in the family tree and isolating where it went wrong and starting a new branch from, from that side where we take all the benefits of sort of those web 2.0 companies that you talked about and all the amazing things. Cause clearly, I mean, it changed the world, like you said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and just uh, branching off from where they started to uh, take I mean, advantage of their consumer base. I've listened to some of your guests and I think, and this is what's great about it. You have like great guests and you have great ways of asking questions to get information out. And I don't know who said this, but 
um, you know, it was uh, the first, there's another form of this. It happened many, like a hundred years ago, you know, the Gutenberg pr uh, press printing machine. You know? yeah. So that allowed a whole new group of people and made information travel a lot better and that empowered people and ultimately better things happen. So that was internet 1.0. That was, you know, basically getting information around everyone becoming more aware of things so they can make their own, have their own judgment of things. Um, I think this, but that ultimately turned into, and I think your guest even said it, a, a very bad system because now you have fake things going, being published. Everyone is a publisher now. So uh, it became like printing facts to just printing opinions and persuading people. You're trying to basically poke at their feelings as opposed to make them think about things. So it's like it turned into the, the lowest common denominator entertainment aspect as opposed to getting real information to people's uh, minds so they can think properly. Sure. That was Robert Breedlove. He's brilliant. And he was basically talking about how that took the power away from the church because people had access to information that wow. wasn't directly fed to them from the church. And as you said, it sort of evolved to their benefit at first. And then obviously to our detriment yeah. sort of later, you talked about how these things develop in parallel universes. And I, I sort of love that um, because that's often how I think about the future of the financial system. A lot of people in the crypto space like to talk about replacing the banks and the death of the dollar and Bitcoin becoming a global currency. Okay, possible, I guess. But I, I like to think that it's more realistic that we can build a system that runs alongside that, that allows people to opt out and function you know, throughout their lives without having to rely on those legacy systems. So if that's the case, is that really what you guys are building at this point is sort of that parallel system that allows people to opt out without replacing it? So the Avalanche protocol has um, easy subnets and subnets are basically, think of it almost like a private blockchain. So if enterprises wanted to come in and create their own private blockchain, which is, you know, permission, they can do that for the benefit of the workflow, as opposed to the, the spirit of what crypto and blockchain is all about. So we allow for both worlds. And reality is, if you're talking about DeFi as an as a example, DeFi is fantastic. It's showing the world where we can be one day. You're definitely disintermediating a lot of people and, and, and stuff in between. You're allowing trap money to be out there. So in theory, that's part of the reason why yields are, are, are higher. But it does, it is a riskier bet. That's why the yields are so high. You don't know. There's a lot of unknown risks there. Whereas in the traditional finance world, and it's also frankly a different market, like not everyone is involved in DeFi or wants to be in DeFi. Sure. The traditional financial world, the yields are lower because there's frankly a lot of rules, regulations, and intermediaries that help protect the end consumer. So almost think of like each intermediary as providing a service, taking a piece of that yield, giving the customer a more safe risk adjusted yield at the end of the day and they feel comfortable with that. So right now, if you talk about the consumer, you can almost think about it like there are two different consumers. One that prefers high volatility and higher yield. The other one wants stable, lower yield, but I know my money will be there if um, something hits the fan. Right, I think that's all good and well until those yields become zero in those systems, which is sort of where we are. And to your point, well, that goes back to your earlier dollar comment, okay? Right. So that was not the financial infrastructure. That is governments around the world forgetting that the, in their country, the ecosystems, the financial economy inside of their country it is just a reflection of the product that they are able to provide. And I like to almost think about the U.S. Fed and the government thinking of the dollar as their product. And if you think of dollar as their product, what they are doing right now is literally devaluing that product by increasing supply at rates no one's ever seen before. I mean, uh, you know, we went through this financial crisis and then in 2008, and they started printing money. Back then, if, and that's not that long ago, you and I have been around, but like that, it's yeah. only 10 plus years ago, 11, 12 years. And we talked about the number trillion and we were like, wow. And now they throw like it out there like it's years pennies. Later. Yeah. So it's a now passing it's, thought. Yeah. That's nothing. That's nothing. What is a trillion? I mean, I saw in your Twitter feed, the Mark Yusko did a great job of explaining what a few trillion is. And that was a yeah. great way to like let people think about how much money that is. So they are devaluing their own best and biggest product 
And I fear, and I think Peter Thiel is, uh, was on CNBC today talking about it. I fear that, you know, one of the best things we have is going to be devalued and letting other countries take the lead in things that we should be doing. So, yeah, Peter Thiel is interesting because I, I believe, you know, I, I can't quote him obviously off the top of my head, but the gist of what he said was that uh, China would weaponize Bitcoin against the United States um, for the very reason that you just discussed. He's a huge Bitcoin bull. So I think a lot of people were taking it as much more of a negative than he intended it. I think he was just obviously showing how powerful Bitcoin is and how the practice you just described of printing is dangerous. But I actually think they're much more likely to weaponize a central bank digital currency against the United States, a, a digital yuan, which they're actively trying to do. I, I really don't see Bitcoin as being their tool. I think that's great. Like it's another maximalist dream to give it that much importance, but that's why they're developing central bank digital currency there, right? I think uh, they're both related. So their CB, you know, their central bank digital currency gives them more power, but promoting Bitcoin affects other um, central banks. So like one's a tool for diminishing someone else and the other tool is used for making themselves more powerful. That makes perfect sense. That makes perfect sense. So that said, do we see the Chinese or other central banks start to hold uh, Bitcoin on their balance sheet, just like we see, you know, the micro strategies and Teslas and squares of the world? Well, I think we got to keep the uh, micro strategies and the Teslas still. I mean, that's just a long runway for that. Yes. You know, I think Tesla has like 1.5 billion or something now in Bitcoin, some, some large number. Um, but the what, where I read was uh, in the uh, S&P 500. Um, there is like still trillions of dollars that are just sitting in cash on the balance sheets of those S&P 500 companies. So if you just took a small percentage of those, yeah. that cash going into Bitcoin, um, you know, we're talking about 100,000 easily. So th there is still a long way for that group before even the central banks do it. The central banks who are, are involved in this, it seems like they're more interested in um, in using the benefits of the technology, but uh, right. giving them more control. So again, it's kind of like a better gizmo for them to have more yeah. control. Yeah, I mean, I say this all the time, but like a digital currency is a central bank wet dream, right? Yes. It's perfect yep. and perfect. Uh -huh. control of every single penny, well, yep. maybe not pennies in their case, but uh, they can control the money supply and every single transaction. Totally I mean, that's, public. this is probably why Facebook is doing their own, you know, digital currency because they have so much information on us, but now if they can marry that directly to, to the actual purchase of things, then what freedom do we have? It's like kind of gone. It's terrifying. Honestly, um, you, you talked about these trillions of dollars uh, locked in their balance sheet. I, I listened to a recent interview you did and you mentioned that $360 trillion are locked in an outdated financial system. What, what right. were you talking about specifically when you said that? So I think the World Bank is estimated or the World uh, Economic Organization, one of these big bodies have estimated there's like 720 you know, trillion dollars of assets out there. A lot of that is in public stock markets and public things that people can get assets to. But like there's a lot of real estate and things that are not easily exchangeable that sit on balance sheets of enterprises as well as um, financial service firms. If you can digitize a lot of that, and, and, and basically issue that and allow those assets to free flow and exchange and, and of ownership, then we are talking about unlocking more value with better price discovery. That's, that's basically what I was talking about. And then you give access to the individual to possibly purchase things that before only a large private equity firm can actually buy or dedicated real estate funds or dedicated whatever type funds. So that, that's what I meant by that. Guys, unless you've been living under a rock, you know that one of the most exciting use cases of crypto now is to earn yield and also to take low interest loans, especially since you earn next to nothing in your crappy legacy bank account. Nexo is leading the charge in this arena with 360 degree crypto banking services. One thing that I'm really excited about that's new is that they have the Nexo Exchange. It's a real game changer with more than 75 crypto and fiat pairs to swap between instantly without leaving the Nexo wallet app and with prices fixed at order submission. Their smart routing system gives a best price guarantee by connecting you to multiple exchanges. 
Now, if you're looking to park your crypto and earn yield, you can make up to 12% annual interest for doing absolutely nothing. If you're looking for a loan, they have them for as little as 5.9% APR, and you don't have to sell your crypto, which we all know is a taxable event. The credit lines are also dynamic, meaning that as the value of your crypto goes up, so does your available credit. This is so cool and innovative, and I've never seen something like that before. So please check them out at nexo.io slash exchange and put your crypto to work for you. Okay, so with a weird, some might say, semi-post-apocalyptic 2020 very much done and dusted, it's time to tear the new year in two and send your Bitcoin into play with a killer promo from the team at BitCasino. Drop a 5 milli Bitcoin minimum on any of the platform's 2,000 or so Bitcoin slots and get 200 free spins to use on the legacy of dead. To claim your 200 free spins, use the promo link bitcasino.io slash scott, that's S-C-O-T-T. Log in or register an account, head over to the rewards section and enable the bonus called Legacy of Dead 200 FS. Wager 5 milli Bitcoin on any slot game after that, and you'll get 200 spins on the house just for being you. BitCasino was ahead of the crypto game before the game got going. The original Bitcoin-led online gaming destination, they continue to set the standard for fun, fast, and fair gameplay. Deposit, wager, and withdraw in Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Tron, and more. All in real time, all the time with BitCasino. Right. Moving along. This episode is sponsored by Cosmos. You guys are probably very familiar with their very popular Atom token. But what's absolutely amazing about this is it's not the project themselves that are sponsoring the show. It's their community. They pooled their resources and funds to get the word out because they're so incredibly passionate about their project. Now, why are they passionate about it? Well, there's a few things I'm really excited about. First, they have a new DEX or decentralized exchange that's coming out that will connect to any blockchain where you can swap ERC-20, Ethereum tokens, or any other token with Atom. Also, this decentralized exchange will have order books just like you see on centralized exchanges, which does not exist right now in the DEX world. It's really mind-blowing. Also, they've launched an incredible open source interconnect protocol that will bridge any blockchain to any other through the Cosmos hub. They're redefining interoperability Guys, you have to check out everything that Cosmos is doing and go ahead and check out the Atom token. You can do all of that at cosmos.network. You and I talked about NFTs in our last conversation and people obviously now we've seen this boom, it's on Saturday Night Live. It's become a catchphrase, you know, in the mainstream, but they think about it as sort of the art and someone selling a tweet for $2.5 million and things like that. But what you're talking about here is the more exciting use case of non-fungible tokens in my mind. Well, there's... There's, I think the other thing is very fun and you need fun in life. So like, yeah, I, awesome. I don't know how you define use, but like, I think both worlds will exist. Yes. So um, I think the, since we last talked, I mean, NFT market was nothing back then. <laughs> Today it's, it's like, ago. It, it's incredible. Um, we're getting calls left and right. And what NFT has actually done that I think has been even better than the DeFi community has done is it's brought over traditional athletes, uh, celebrities, and other things into this world. It's done a much better. If you, someone's doing, I think there's like uh, X hundreds of millions of dollars of transactions now in NFTs. But if you do the analysis behind it, um, I would bet that is more what they call normies than pure. Um, it's a bigger pie for the normies than it yeah, is for it, It's certainly, OG. yeah. A- anecdotally, but I have friends that I've tried to get into Bitcoin, tried to get into DeFi forever and kind of laughed at me and didn't touch it, who are now like degenerate NBA Top Shot fans opening packs and flipping, you know, cards. And for people, I'm in my 40s. That's what we did with baseball cards in the 80s, right? So you talk about it being sort of more mainstream accessible. I think there's a familiarity to people trading scarce items. Everybody has done it, whether it was Garbage Pail Kids or Pokemon cards or whatever it was. I think that's touched everyone's lives. So I think that's probably the appeal there. That's a big part of the appeal. The other thing is the instruments involved. What I mean by that is um, they've made the experience. I don't know if you how many times you've gone to NBA Top Yeah, Shot. it's awesome. <laughs> it's, it's great, but you have no idea. It's a blockchain. It might as well be a centralized server. I think the ultimate point was that you have the certificate of authentication and may or may not be that piece of art, but that sits on something where you can go in like a registry and check that that is yours, transparency, all that. But 
the abstract it away from that, you have no idea that that was done on the blockchain. This goes back right. to you say, what are things like in 10 years? I'm hoping we don't even talk about it. It's just like AWS, where are you hosted? You don't even talk about it in my basement in a cage or in the cloud. It's th th that they've made that experience easy. Yeah. Uh, but that begs the question, which my same friend asked me about. He was like, well, what if like, I, I believe that's all built on flow, right? Like what if that blockchain just ceases to be used? What happens to all of my NBA top shot cards that I'm holding? <laughs> great point. So if I look at that, at least the, the uh, NBA top shot, and that's a great point. So right now flow is a, it's a good blockchain, but it's built on the classical uh, protocol. So it's fast, but it's not very decentralized and it's got its own little thing, but um, it's a closed system. It's almost like texting in uh, AOL days where you can only go back and forth with the other people on AOL. And I think you and I were a little bit too young, but there was a day where there was just Betamax and VHS. And oh, that's, I remember. So, and Betamax was pretty popular for a long it time. It was better. People. It, it was, was a better be technology exactly. and That's it just why. lost. Yep. Yeah, it, it was better. It was quality was better. But what they got wrong was, I think it was Sony, whatever. So like, it was like Sony made the movies, Sony made the machines and Sony sold it. So you had a very vertically integrated thing and it was a closed system. And VHS was like, well, any studio can make a film and anyone, any brand, Panasonic, you name RCA, whatever, you guys could all make it. And all of a sudden that openness took over. So- I mean, I think there will be vertical specialists, as we talked about it before. So with uh, Flow, what they can do is create brand and create uh, a business development experience and competitive edge that way. And then hopefully they can have a great product for that sustainable. But I like to believe taking lessons from life of VHS and all the stuff we just talked about, the more multi-chain open network ultimately wins out in the long run. Yeah, let's just hope for people who are collecting that Flow doesn't become Laserdisc because remember those huge platters that looked like you and I are going like, to date ourselves. You should stop talking about this because you're going to lose your <laughs> younger fans and you have a Sorry. lot of fans. <laughs> yeah, I love those things though. My friend had them. I thought they were the coolest thing. It was like a huge mirror. But um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I, I do agree. I think that, you know, the NFTs just for, for so many reasons are more mainstream, uh, you know, accessible. And DeFi, it's a little scarier because it's banking, right? I mean, it's your money. It's not fun. It's not a collectible. It's literally like some people want it to be their bank. But what happens? So we've talked about, obviously, that there's all these intermediaries and it's a safer system when you're in legacy systems. But that yield is gone. And we all know that there's too many intermediaries. It'd be one thing if there was one person who checked off, but why are there five toll collectors in my transaction from bank to bank? But that, that's a separate topic. What happens when legacy systems start to co-op this, right? We've already seen the OCC say, hey, banks can custody Bitcoin. To me, that's not a far step from saying it's going to be collateral for loans, right? And we've already seen, hey, we don't need, you know, maybe we'll test stable coins instead of swift transactions and these things. So what happens when those very systems that I guess we're trying to detach from start to co-opt te the technology and, and the benefits? Well, I think ultimately the answer is, and this is a long, long view. So I think there's a long runway for DeFi products. Um, basically it's integrated with your life. And ultimately that translates to a better user experience because somehow we figured out the right amount of assurance we need from intermediaries with uh, improved services and functionality of what I think DeFi can give you and you inherent in anything there's a trade-off how much you know self-governance do i want and how much uh other things do i want to give up in order to gain that just like with web 2.0 how much of the efficiency and fun parts about texting and all these apps do i want and the question is how much privacy and and data of myself do i want to give up and at some point the people will vote and hopefully there will be a happy medium somewhere such an interesting question because bitcoiners are so passionate about self-governance and being your own bank. But I still make the argument that even if you explain that to your average person, more than 90% of people want nothing to do with being your own bank and self-governance. In fact, they would give up almost anything for the convenience and the security of knowing that they didn't have to worry about it. Uh, yeah. Again, not everyone's going to want the same thing. So two products will exist, exist for a long time. And um, for certain people, having self-custody and then seeing what Robinhood and GameStop did, like conceptually, what happened there? Like 
Robin Hood basically seemed to people arbitrarily just decided to make a new rule as to how much collateral. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and you're on Robin Hood and they say, you cannot trade these stocks anymore. You feel like you've been gypped. Um, but if you were part of a decentralized system, one, in theory, you would have been, you know, uh, voting on that proposal. So at least you would have had some heads up. And then two, you custody it. So like, okay, it happened here. Fine. Everyone else wanted it, but it's a multi-chain world and it's easy to be interoperable. So I will take my self-custody GameStop shares and move to, I don't know, Schwab and then trade it there. So if you explain it like that to people, I think you tell people more and more to like, hey, I want to be self-empowered instead of at the uh, back and call of the giant tech companies or the government. Yeah, it's like Cartman in South Park. Screw you guys, I'm going home. You know, like I'm taking my ball and I'm going home. I don't want to play yeah. with you guys anymore. And you have that option. But Robinhood traders did it, right? And, and not only did they not have that option, I think that somewhere deep in the terms of service that no human being has ever read, it basically said they can liquidate a non-leverage position, you think you own a stock. So in this decentralized world, you literally custody it. You didn't even own that stock. They liquidated people who thought they had just bought a stock like they had their whole lives on E-Trade or something, and they didn't. They had a, uh, a line in a ledger on a centralized database at Robinhood as who was the ultimate custodian of all of those stocks, basically. So nobody, yeah, people just didn't even realize they didn't own their stock. And I think that that's like... If any example in the past few months just shines such a sh bright and impenetrable light on this, that Robin Hood GameStop thing was, you know, why DeFi is necessary, whether it's for you or not, is a different conversation, but Correct. why we need to have it. Absolutely. That's why I'm a big proponent for DeFi. I'm, I'm a proponent for choice. Okay. Yeah. This exactly. is what this does and transparency. You're, again, going back to Robin Hood, all these terms of services in these huge tech companies, like, they know no one can actually read it because you actually read those terms of service. You would never, never actually do anything because it takes too long to read those things. Some lawyer, a team of lawyers somewhere put it together to basically absolve these companies of all their responsibilities. Yep. So like, fine. Uh, let's I'm going to have full take of everything that could possibly go wrong and list it. <laughs> right. <laughs> somewhere. Exactly. Exactly. Like if I'm going to take full responsibility for everything that happens here, then let me monetize myself or let me have choice into what happens. Right. And I mean, talking about, you know, eventually the banks coming in or how there would be this sort of marriage between legacy systems and DeFi. I mean, we're seeing real adoption from a lot of companies, right? PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, Goldman, Morgan Stanley, and they're all sort of adopting crypto in different ways. It's sort of fun to watch. None of them are certainly going fully down the rabbit hole, right? But they're all finding the part that works for their business and starting to test the waters, it feels like. What do you make of all that? Well, I think... Um... They're listening, especially, you know, I've had conversations with a lot of those players. And if you look at a PayPal, for instance, you know, they have 300 million users and 29 million merchants on the other side. They basically have listened to their customers and customers are telling them they want this. So the way they're going about it is actually quite smart, in my opinion. Um, on the front end or the UX and the UI, the user has no idea. It's just like, again, it's just like their normal Venmo wallet or a PayPal wallet. It's seamless. And that's why adoption is happening so quickly in late 2020 and early 2021, because you're giving a, a, a normie or a newbie a user experience that they're very comfortable with. On the back end, if you really explore what PayPal is doing on the back end, it is a mess. It's a mess, but they are taking care of the mess and they are using um, crypto companies who have proven excellence and have a history to help them solve that. In the end, um, the user doesn't know uh, what's happening underneath the surface. It's literally like kind of eating a hot dog or sausage. You do not want to go into the factory to see how it's made, <laughs> but it tastes good. Yeah, it makes total sense. And that, yeah, that's the same thing. People just want something that's familiar, right? Nobody wants to go. I mean, there's people who do, but the biggest barrier has always been like trying to explain to someone going to get a private wallet and how to send their coins there and typing in that right. long address. But if you just go on PayPal and you hit a button that looks just like the other button you've always hit on PayPal, it's super easy. That's right. I mean, I like to think about it like uh, people in the uh, smart contract uh, layer one world, uh, the guys that I know were more technologists and PayPal is a great product company. They a product, you know, is in the inter in between technology and, and user and biz dev, and they figured out how to get it to people's hands 
in a very efficient and good way, but they still need the underlying technology. Right. And more importantly, on the merchant side, which I think a lot of people get confused on, uh, it's the same thing for the merchant. To turn on crypto payments, they get paid in fiat. It's sort of like taking American Express and just accepting that you're going to pay the fee, right, right, for them. But it's not like they need to worry about what they're going to do with the Bitcoin when somebody pays them in Bitcoin. They're, it's not like Tesla, who's actually trying to hold the Bitcoin that they're getting paid in. That's right. That's exactly right. And the next iteration of this is that that merchant who's used to paying two and a half percent away to use the credit card rails, once a PayPal or these banks figure out how to use stablecoin and do all this stuff, suddenly they see the benefit when it's no longer two and a half percent and it's only whatever percent or basis points it is. And then in theory, they will pass some of the uh, that benefit. You know, you're in theory, you're paying two and a half percent more on some merchandise because, well, Part of that two and a half is shared between you and the merchants in theory. And hopefully you get back some of that as well as a consumer. Sure. Uh, and the payments thing is so interesting because obviously we love the idea that we can pay in crypto and we love the idea that a merchant will accept it, but almost nobody wants to pay in crypto, right? Like why, to you, why would use you? Your, use yeah, your appreciating asset to buy that depreciating car. You, yeah, exactly. Appreciating asset to buy something that's depreciating. And second, the, the rules and regulations are still very difficult. IRS treats it like a property. So there's yeah, you're selling taxes something. involved. Your all-in cost is still higher if you do. Right, because you're selling your Bitcoin to buy that car. So That's if you're right. in the top tax bracket and buying a Tesla, you basically have a 37% liability, like a tax liability on top of the price of your car. That's right. That's right. Only in the United States, though. There are places that have much more reasonable uh, views, most places actually, than the United States. And I wonder if we'll get to a place where our regulators sort of uh, view it more as money or at least not as property, kind of like a Forex trade or something. It will get better, but um, I don't know. As long as we are in this money printing mode uh, where budget deficits are just like nothing and they want, uh, they're going to find any way possible to tax. Sure. They need got to pay for it somehow, right? <laughs> Unfortunately. So then, I mean, that's the payment side, obviously, that I touched on the pay, the PayPal's, the Visa's, the MasterCard's. Then there's the bank side, right? So we have Morgan Stanley, which I just think is so funny, offering crypto services, but only if you hold $2 million with Morgan Stanley, <laughs> right? right? I actually, had a, you'll find this funny. I had a guest on, Jason Yanowitz from Blockworks, and he said that he had a connection at Morgan Stanley. And they said that basically their largest like bracket of, uh, customers has about 1.5 to 2 million in assets with Morgan Stanley. So they set that not arbitrarily sort of as like an incentive to get those people to hold more other assets to get up to the 2 million to be able to transact. Yeah, that's hilarious. That is fascinating. Jeez. Okay. Which totally makes sense. Totally yeah. makes sense. But what do you make of the fact that these banks are only opening it to their wealthiest of clients? Well, um, I think they are in fairness to them, they're still very hamstrung in many ways. Yeah. They are, they have tons of regulation and they, a lot of times want, if the regulations uh, on the 50 yard line, they're going to be so far away from the 50 yard line because they have too large of existing business. So um, I think they do that just like there are accreditation rules in, in order for people to invest in privates or alternative assets. They're doing that just to make sure they're way um, away from any gray zone and toe dip. <laughs> yep, exactly. They get to uh, help out with, you know, say that they're involved and, and do it in a very, very risk adjusted, safe way. Right. So the question is, do they actually have any intention in doing it? Or are they just sort of assuaging the demands of their clients who keep asking when Bitcoin, you know, that's it, my, it, my feeling to some degree is that none of them really probably want to touch it to any great degree, but they're getting pressure. And when the clients start asking, you got to put something out there. It, it, it's it's even yes it's that and it's also when you see clients start taking money away from them and putting it elsewhere and then finally they're like well it's going to go into this somewhere do i want to do it or not and they're also very hypocritical because their investment banking size banking coinbase and banking all of these things are and there are spacs like on backed uh, happening so your investment banking side can make money on this but your commercial banking side or your wealth side won't let people get involved there's a huge, huge discrepancy there. And I know the banking laws are different on the commercial versus the investment banking side. So that's part of it. But I also think, you know, it's self-serving to say we can invest 
in these things uh, as an I can service them as a banker in the investment banking side, but we can't on the commercial side. Right, makes sense. I guess to, you know protect protect your butt. Um, you just brought up uh, Coinbase, and they're very much the hot uh, hot button topic right now because they're having their direct listing next week, which everybody seems to be calling an IPO, even though it's not, um, okay, whatever, it's semantics, right? Um, but it's interesting, they just reported uh, first quarter earnings. And I mean, without going into the numbers, it's a trend we see, I think, across all exchanges and everything crypto related, but they effectively crushed all of 2020 in the first quarter of 2021. I think they had 56 million new users in 2021 in three months and like 42 or 44 or something in all of 2020. It, I don't even know what to say. When I looked at that, I was just like, holy cow, this is insane. Um, but I think there's two takeaways from that. One, um, and this is very important, I think, because the if you look at the uh, massive amount of dollars they custody and a lot of that business, where it came from, it is more institutional. The growth is more higher on the institutional side and in people coming over to the crypto world as opposed to OG crypto people. Oh, so, for sure. They don't touch Coinbase. <laughs> they, I mean, literally, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's a whole different slew of people. Um, but I don't think people realize that they are all these new incoming people are actually doing DeFi and everyone else a huge service. Um, so this money comes over in Bitcoin. Usually they play around and then they somehow find Ethereum because it's fun. And somehow they get into like USDC and after three, four, five months of continuing having fun with uh, Ethereum, Bitcoin, and USDC, their money finds their way into the world of DeFi, and then the DeFi um, world keeps growing that way. So it's so they are doing the benefit, and it's kind of like a it's a funny thing because it's like a bathtub, and the water from the faucet is coming out much faster than the drain on the bottom of this thing. Yeah, I just laugh because as a child of the 80s, all I could think of is like the Bitcoin comparison to like marijuana as a gateway drug. You just try it. <laughs> so they used to say at the beginning of the war on drugs, right? Like the Reagan and, and Bush years, it was like, if you try marijuana, you're going to like be a crackhead on the corner in three weeks. And that's sort of like the, the, what, the 30, the 40 years later, now we're legalizing it. So yeah. I guess, you know, a parallel universe for another 30 years. So if things have been compressed, so oh, be like three so it took 30, 40 years to legalize. <laughs> 30, 40 years to legalize marijuana. So maybe before DeFi and, and CFI converge is probably only 20. So let's let's, yeah. let's cut it down. Yeah, I mean, we're easily dog years in crypto, if not like one to 10 instead of one to seven. It's pretty, it's pretty, um, it's pretty crazy. I mean, I, I think regardless of your thoughts about Coinbase, I think they could potentially be one of the biggest and most important companies in the world. It's amazing. I mean, yes, they have the users and they have, you know, all the financial methods. It's amazing because- you're looking at a, effectively a crypto company with better financial metrics than most financial services companies. By far. And the, the only question is, what do you want to pay for that? And do you look at their, do you believe that that growth is very um, boom bust cycle? Like we've seen in the last three or four iterations, you know, from 2013 to 2017, then bust and now back to 2020 or do you model this out like it's we've crossed the Rubicon and this is secular growth? That will determine your multiple and to be a right. big difference of what you're willing to pay. Even in their earnings statement or call, they sort of alluded to the fact that, hey man, Bitcoin's doing really well, so we're doing well. So the, I guess the question then is, does the paradigm shift to where they do well regardless, or are they really continuing to ride this bullish trend of the actual asset? Well, that's a bit dangerous if that's the case. I'm, I'm kind of in the camp that, and I'm hoping, maybe I'm hoping for this, that we're still in boom bust. Because if we're still in boom bust, that means we are still a cottage industry. I feel like as an operator, there's so much more to be done. And you asked this question, what happens when um, traditional finance comes and starts doing a lot of these things? And we know they are handicapped, whether they can or cannot do it. Right. I'm kind of selfishly, I want to keep doing it. So sure. if I see secular trend or Coinbase, it means we're more long the tooth in this trend. But if I see more boom bust, that means I just have more opp uh, more opportunities to keep innovating. Makes total so. sense. I want, I want to jump back to something you talked about earlier because it's so interesting and something that's somewhat unique to what you guys are doing. You talked about being able to create these permissioned 
blockchains for clients who come in, which I think, you know, for anyone, that would be similar to like JP Morgan coin, right? It's very, uh, it's for one specific person purpose. It's one company. It's completely centralized to that company, but you guys have the flexibility. I mean, primarily you have a permissionless blockchain, but then you can build these permission blockchains off of it as sort of branches. Is that, is that correct? And can you explain correct, why correct. that's important? That That's exactly right. And then you have Call it like the master key that allows you to, to open the gateway to the permissionless world easily, like an API key that allows you to easily go into the permissionless whenever you want to. And I think the, the importance of that is the, for we, again, we talked about that 360 trillion of financial assets that sit on um, financial services firms. Part of the reason why they can't unlock it is because there are rules and regulations and they have to control how the asset flows and who buys, et cetera. So if you give someone a, a permission blockchain, then they can basically dictate the governance rules in the validator set and they can decide and, and rules are constantly changing, regulations constantly changing. So if you give them that capability in order to like be flexible, given how the regulators change rules and let them decide who gets to be part of their validator set and what the governance and how far away from the gray matter you wanna be, then they are more likely to adopt the technology, at least get the benefit of the workflow automation and maybe not get the whole spirit of the thing, but, but start getting to be part of the, of the movement, if you will. And that was the main reason why Eamon Gunsir, the professor who founded um, Ava Labs, you know, when, when he constructed this architecture of this thing, thought about how to do it. So it's interesting because it really allows you to be kind of something for everyone. Like uh, regardless of what you want to do, if you believe that blockchain is going, as you said, you're never going to think about it. It's going to be the thing that's running it. Like you never think about what's running your cell phone. You just use it. You never think about what's running the internet. You just use it. Everyone can build their sort of iteration or vision of that on your technology. Yeah, that's right. And do it in a relatively easy way. So in enterprise deals that we've talked to, obviously there are like, you know, big private blockchains out there. When, when our team goes in there and does a bake off of one of those, the, the biggest response has always been, hey, it's very easy to do it on yours. As a, it's kind of like when you wanted a website in 2000, it was a lot harder. You had to hire a consulting firm to come in and it was still very, like, you know, not so great. Now it's WYSIWYG. You just go to like Wix or someone and, and you can just drag and click and, and then you have it instantly. I used, to and have it's better too. Web, yeah, I used to have a flash website and literally if I wanted to change like five words on it, I had to call a programmer to completely redo everything. It was, I mean, it's so clunky when you think about it. That's insane. Absolutely. Yeah. Now everything is completely customizable. I, I'm curious, we, we kind of touched on regulators before. How much do regulators play into your like day-to-day -day decision making? Do you have any fears that they could change something that could fundamentally alter what you're doing or that you would no longer be compliant when you thought you were a month ago or anything like that. I see that as such a huge problem for everything in this space. Yeah, I mean, I think any um, crypto company who doesn't think about regulation and complying to, to the rules in their jurisdiction are, are, are basically silly. So it's a big- but That part happens of how, all the time, right? Well, you know, maybe less, uh, it's less in the frontal lobe of people who are offshore, but when you're onshore, um, it is part of every decision making um, thing that we have to do. And our you know, bills with the lawyers are insane. So the real issue is, do the lawyers really know? And the, the answer- I had that conversation, yeah, yeah. I had that conversation with Sam Bankman Freed. I made a joke. I was like, you must have more lawyers than employees. It was like, I do, but they all give me different answers and it makes me more confused. And everybody's just covering their own backside to give you the answer they think that uh, will protect them instead of actually you. And it causes more confusion. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and ultimately, that's why, you know, that's why all these things are domiciled over in Asia, it's just like, it, it makes it easier for him to do a lot of things. But, yeah, which is another awesome. problem we talked about, like keeping the lead here. I mean, we still have unbelievable capital reserves in this country that want to get involved in this. We have great innovation. I'm hoping we find a way to keep all of that in the US. Well, it does seem like we have some are having a transition to at least some people in power who have an understanding or belief in it. Like Gary Gensler, obviously, I mean, teaches blockchain and, you know, SEC at the head of SCA, Hester Peirce. You know, we have Senator, like Senator Loomis talks about 
being a hodler and like all these kind of cool things. So I think we are making progress and that we probably do have advocates for the first time in government. Absolutely. hundred percent agree. So the question is, uh, when do when do we start seeing, I guess, the crypto companies being the largest donator? Well, Sam Bankman fried was the largest donator, a top five <laughs> donator to the Biden campaign. So I guess we've seen it. You didn't need to ask me. I'm glad you answered it because that's, yeah. you know, yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's naming an arena in, in Miami, too, while he's at it. I mean, <laughs> I mean, good for him. I was down there Amazing. talking to the mayor when, when this whole thing was happening and uh, good for him. Good for him. So what, what's the next step for you guys? I mean, obviously everything's being built. You've gone from 40 to 100 people. You've got 50 projects when it was zero. Did you say you have another 100 in the pipeline. How, how do you see this at scale? So, I mean, the mission is still the same. We want as many new projects and things to, and assets that, that want to take advantage of what we can offer on our, you know, on the platform of Avalanche, basically. So that means the, um, the, the providing constantly uh, on the core platform updates so that it's kind of like your iOS phone. There's constant like software updates so that you can improve the underlying um, speeds, costs, as well as features. So that's on the, you know, the platform level. And then on the uh, uh, business development front, it is to be out there and figure out what tooling, like a covalent or infrastructure stuff that you need and, and reach out to the players and, and, and have them build it on top of Avalanche so that more developers can have even more creative things to build. So I think the answer is we're probably not gonna be done until a big portion of that 360 trillion is actually flowing through crypto, either through us or with you know, our, our um, you know, friends in the space. And that happens when that land that you're talking about that's locked up and it's so impossible to transfer the deed or escrow the money, that happens when that land is represented by a non-fungible token and you can just sell your land to me and we send it over the blockchain, we're done. Either right? a non-fungible <laughs> token or some other, uh, I'm sure you know. in a year from now, we'll be talking another three letter acronym because someone's maybe you know, NFT better. Even, even since we've well, actually, it's not true. It's been a, a couple of years. Like we've gone from ERC 721 to 1155 right. with slightly different features. So this is evolving. And um, sure, the answer is similar to what you said. It won't be the same three letter acronym. Right. So we're just effectively eliminating all of those middlemen, making a transaction that's directly between two people, which allows it to happen when it's almost impossible in the current As system. close as possible. When you, when you can eliminate all of that, ultimately you and I have the best experience and the cheapest experience. I love the idea. I just, it's very frustrating to think about how difficult they're going to make it to get there. Because all those toll collectors, I mean, they're the wealthiest people in the world and they've made that wealth by being the toll collectors. <laughs> Tell Sam to donate more. Seriously, seriously what's five? Five million is like, drop in the bucket. It's absolutely Brand? nothing. Come on. Exactly. So what do you think? I'm just curious, totally separate topic. I'm curious if he had five on each side and then all of a sudden publicize this side when the results are in. That, that, that would be wise. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it, but um, I'm curious uh, just personally, because obviously my background is music and it's my passion. What do you see happening in the music space with NFTs? Well, I think, um, well, obviously I think everyone saw Kings of Leon. And I don't yeah. know if I can mention specific groups or whatever, but there are definitely artists reaching out. Um, they want, I think, two things. One is to understand what this hype and euphoria is all about and whether yeah. they can help monetize some of their own brand via this. That's one thing. And then the, the business people around these artists, they're trying to figure out if there's a way to improve the existing business model of what they Royalty do. structure. I mean, my God. Yeah. Exactly. Royalty structure. They want to be like um, Courtney Cox and get a royalty on every single Friends episode that it shows up somewhere. So it's like effectively building in the intelligence into the smart contract that every secondary transaction of this thing, a piece of that goes back to the artist so they can capture more. Um, and then new use cases like ticketing. Right now there's intermediaries like Ticketmaster using QR codes and QR codes have been known to easily copy and make frauds. There are five yeah. people showing up at the same seat. Same ticket, yep. Exactly. 
And the artist really doesn't know who's the end guy using it. I mean, one of the best things about NFTs, it's this providence. You can see the history and then all of a sudden, you know, your fans better. Maybe you can provide a better product because you know, your yeah, fans better. You have direct access to that fan. You can sell them experiences, merchandise and all these things at a higher, I mean, it just makes so much sense, especially, I mean, it's no coincidence. I don't think that this has exploded sort of during COVID because everybody had to look for alternate ways to make money when there's no shows. But anyone who, if anyone who knows the music business, you make your money on shows. Right. Right. Yep. That's right. And so if you need to find a new revenue stream, this is a pretty brilliant one. I find it so incredible what could potentially be done. And uh, if this was invented and, earlier. Maybe you still be playing music and you wouldn't ser- be serious, talking to me. <laughs> seriously. Uh, definitely possible. I mean, NBA top shot, the NBA gets a piece of every secondary transaction, right? They're getting their cut of every single thing, no matter how far down the chain it goes. Exactly what you're talking about. Yep. That's right. So it's a great thing for them. But yeah, I don't know if the users who are buying this stuff really realize what they own just yet. I mean, it's not like you can take that moment of someone dunking a basketball and then resell that to um, ESPN for the top 10 plays of the, of the week or something. It is more like your baseball card thing, um, which yeah. is like, hey, it has some value to me for whatever reason, sentimental value or whatever, but it may not have much value to anyone else until that guy becomes, I think you said, Mickey Mantle or something. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's exactly right. I've used the, my, my huge collection of 80s baseball cards, for example, of many things, because I basically had to light them on fire and donate them after I thought they were going to be my retirement, but they weren't scarce, right? So, I mean, it, they printed so many at that, at that time in history, but that doesn't, uh, you know, as you alluded to, it doesn't take away from the ones that are scarce and have real value. And also, I mean, when, when it comes to the NFTs and music and stuff, sometimes you just need that one guy who thinks it's really valuable. You only need one person to buy it from you. So that's right. right. You know, not way, everybody has to accept it. As you know, I listen to your podcast because they're so great. Not only are they educational, but they're entertaining. And, but you gave me like a lot of relief because for many years, I, in the eighties used to collect baseball cards. I played baseball in college. I love it. You know, and I had these giant, you know, boxes, shoe boxes of all these cards. And frankly, they're probably still in some basement in my mom's place with collecting mold and mildew or whatever. But like, I, I always thought like, whoa, this could be so valuable. One day I'm going to go take them Same. and I'm going to go trade it in. But when you, when I heard that you said you actually did that and they were worthless, you gave a huge relief for me. Like, oh, yeah. I didn't leave any, I didn't leave any value on the table there. Basically from like 1984 on. So that everything before still has a level of scarcity, but that's when there was this huge craze and the, and they just started printing them like crazy. So, you know, they're just uh, absolutely worth nothing. And that's the famous baseball card story that every uh, boomer has told their kids. My mom threw away my Mickey Mantle, my 1952 Mickey Mantle. I had that, or I put it in the spokes of my bike to make the sound. I don't know if yeah. you ever heard that one, but that was the big one that's with right. my parents. <laughs> well, these uh, kids I'm, trade Pokemon cards now. I wonder how yeah. that's going to turn out 20 years from now. I don't know, but man, they're making millions doing it. It's unbelievable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So good for them. Yeah. I respect the hustle for sure. So I know we're up against it here. Where can everybody uh, follow you guys and follow you after this conversation? Thanks. First of all, it's a lot of fun. So for Ava Labs, the easiest way is to go to the website, avalabs.org. And that'll get you, if you're a techie, into the Discord channels there, or if you want to be part of the community where you can go there, just go to that website and then learn more about us. And if you want to hear my views, simplest is at John, the number one woo on Twitter. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much for running this back a second time. And I have a feeling that this won't be the last. I think we're, we're going to be due a third in about six months with the velocity of how things are changing. A lot of fun. Thank you very much. Thank you, man. It's great. Let's go.